Hi, folks. Chris Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. The Chris Voss Show. Hey, we're coming to you here uh, live, or actually we're on the podcast, so it's a live recorded podcast. You make that math work. Thanks for tuning in, folks. We appreciate you guys being here. Be sure to go to your YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash Chris Voss. Hit that bell notification. Ding. That uh, I'm, Why am I doing my own sound effects? I don't know why, because I'm too cheap probably anyway guys hit that bell notification so you can get all the notifications for all the stuff we do go to the cvpn or chris voss podcast network.com and you can subscribe to all eight podcasts that we have from a variety of different things over there and all that good stuff and today i've got a very interesting gentleman this is a guy i've known on facebook for i'm not sure for how long but he's one of those people who's kind of come into my sphere of influence and and he's been influencing me with his incredible videos and a lot of the professional stuff that he does on Facebook and I said hey I want to know this guy better and let's bring him on the show which we do a lot of times welcome to the show Michael Walpert Mike how you hey. doing buddy man I'll tell you what after a little uh, set of kind words like that I'm doing much better my there therapist you go. thanks you that's very excellent for me. now I introduce you as Michael Walpert did I do that wrong is it Mike or is it Michael I actually am one of those guys that's pretty comfortable with both, although from my wife, when it turns into Michael, <laughs> things are either going really well or really not so well. Or really so not I so usually, well. Yeah, I usually, uh, uh, people usually prefer Mike in business. All right, Mike so we'll Walpert, do Mike Walpert is. is on the hey. show today, and uh, the only people who call him Michael when they're upset is probably his mom and his wife, so there you go. <laughs> We've all been there. My My mom calls me my full name. Uh, you know, including the middle name. Right. Ooh, that's when that's you, that's good. when you know you should either run for the hills. <laughs> so Mike, welcome to the show. Uh, give us a bio on you. Give us a rundown. Tell us who you are and give us some websites that we can take and look you up on. Okay, sure. Uh, I am by dint of my personality, a sales guy, by dint of my training, a marketing guy. So I spent uh, my first career in the radio business, which I loved because I work at rock and roll radio stations, worked in a bunch of different cities around the country. And that allowed me to really hone the idea of a 60 second story. I mean, it, when you're in the radio business and you're pretty good at selling ads, they give you big fat accounts like Ford, Toyota, McDonald's, Budweiser, and you handle those. But you also have local business. And what I discovered is that big companies spend millions and millions of dollars putting together fancy stories that are actually quite not true. And small business has wonderful true stories. So, uh, you know, that's kind of the background is, is a, a, I'm pretty simple sales awesome. and marketing guy. And, and, and uh, it's, it's, ha it's having some fun that I like. The, so you did radio for a lot of years. This is awesome, man. We got you on the podcast. I see all the great video you do on Facebook. Um, I think you do. Do you publish on LinkedIn? I have been more uh, I have been more active on LinkedIn in the last couple months, mm -hmm. uh, uh, mostly because people are still sticking pretty much to business on LinkedIn, and it's a little mm -hmm. breath of fresh air considering uh, the environment on Facebook. Do we get your website so that people can uh, check that out? Absolutely, I am at socialjumpstart.com, and you can find a uh, uh, some information on the storytelling course. Uh, at mikewalpert.com. And I know we catch, I catch a lot of your great videos you do on Facebook. Are they being posted on YouTube or anywhere else that we can? Uh, we do have, uh, yeah, I have two, two uh, YouTube channels. Same thing, social jumpstart, youtube.com forward slash social jumpstart. Also, uh, less businessy stuff, but still some at Mike Walpert, uh, youtube.com forward slash Mike Walpert. So it's, uh, uh, I, I have a, a weird thing where I put videos up and then, I just never take them down. So if you're interested and it's useful, for, it's useful for some people because I can talk to a client who might not be so comfortable in front of the camera and say, you think you're awkward. Let me show you a video I put up in 2010. You want to see awkward. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think I, I think I have that same sort of issue. You go back and watch my 2009, 2010 videos. Uh, they're okay. They're okay. What's funny is Google, Google just insists on uh, when I did the first video introing doing video, I think it was like 2009, 2010. Uh, they insist on keep using that video as my, as the intro for me laying the foundation for what's gone on now for the last 11 years. And um, I can't ever get them to stop. And it's like this old ass video with just horrible resolution. Cause you know, 
to 11 years ago the resolution was shit you could right. barely get webcam over the internet back then um so anyway um it's great to know you like i said if you haven't got a chance guys check out his videos he does great interviews with uh, lots of interesting people uh he's very active on facebook and uh he make as far as i've ever seen he comes across as a really brilliant guy which is one of the reasons we have, want to have him on the show so you did radio for a lot of years, man. That must have been pretty fun being a... You were a DJ? I was a DJ for two days. Uh, okay. Like, like most guys, or like most guys I know or in that business, you go into the radio business because you couldn't get in a band. So it's the 80s. Uh, not hair band. I was cooler than that. in the punk, kind of that new wave thing. But, you know, I didn't play an instrument, couldn't be in a band. Let's go work at a radio station. Holy cow, that's fun. Uh, gee, the DJs seem to be having fun. And as it turns out, I don't even have the Chris Voss voice, let alone the patience to sit in a room and play in the hot rocking and flame throwing, play in the platters that matter. I mean, I want that. Like, like most people, I hear my voice and it's like, eh, oh, I don't like my voice. But being around the radio business taught me that you can make a living having fun. I mean, Somehow I made it to be 50 something years old and I have had a lot of fun. That's, that's, that's the awesome part about it. I was just, uh, I guess, born lucky enough to have a radio face. So uh, there's no TV work for me. <laughs> 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 but, uh, but people liked my voice. So I guess I got that going for me. But You got uh, to run with what you got. <laughs> you got to run with what you got. But uh, yeah. We just would we'll just and 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 uh, just a shout out to our listeners right now. If you call in and you're number seventeen, you can get Leonard Skinner tickets front row. We've got them at the uh, we've got them at the Delta Center there in Utah. And up next, news, traffic, and weather. Go go to Stacy. Hello, guys. We're up here at the radio station. <laughs> what, what, see, but but when I was in radio, it was a kind of a different animal, right? Now, yeah. and that's I've only been out ten years, so I did put in my last. I put in a stint with Clear Channel and watched the whole uh, uh, less fun environment of radio become corporate. Mm. Uh, The good old days were when a couple of guys in town owned the radio station. uh, And they generally played the kind of music they liked. And, you know, it was just a casual thing. And it was firmly local. Yeah. Like, you'd be lucky if you got some beer advertising or something like that if you were in a big market. Everything else is, you know, Bob's Gym, Mary's mm-hmm. Donut Shop, the local sandwich place, restaurants, car deal. I mean, it's, it, and that's what I love because I think, I mean, I think that, that this economy of ours will continue to grow because of small business, not giant corporation business. I mean, uh, so that's, that's what I love about radio. And that's what I kind of take into the storytelling realm of doing video. Awesome sauce. And, and that was the one thing uh, that I, I've espoused to my younger uh, niece and nephew that are in their teens. Um, and the, it's, for some reason, I didn't get the importance of stories until, I don't know, a year or two ago. Like it never really fucking hit me. And I, you know, I, I started out in life uh, uh, thinking it was all about the end result and getting to the result and winning. And, you know, I grew up poor. So my whole thing was to try and get successful. And, and it was always the end result. And one of the hardest lessons for me to learn were, well, two lessons was it's about the journey because in this life, you're always evolving. And then it's about the collection of stories. Like, you know, I used to go to the uh, opera, ballet, movies, TV. It never occurred to me why these things were important to us as human beings. And it's the story and the stories are lessons. The stories learn, we learn from the stories entertain us. They have a multifaceted value, but appreciating the story. Yeah. Valuing the story. You know, why do we all learn Shakespeare? Like I used to think that was stupid. I'm like, fuck Shakespeare. That guy's old man. Like old news. Like, does he got anything for me? It's like when my family used to come to me and be like, Hey, you know, King George used to be in our lineage. I'm like, do I get a fucking inheritance? If not, fuck that guy. But, uh, no. <clears throat> and it's the, and so only a year or two ago or three, a, a light went on and I started, I read something from somebody and it was like the importance of stories. And I'm like, Holy shit. And I, I've been telling stories for like the past, I don't know, five to 10 years. I've gotten kind of better at, at, at storytelling and 
packaging a story, but I, I didn't really realize what I was trying to do. I was just trying to communicate better the concept of whatever idea I was pushing. And, and God, I wish someone had sat down with me when I was younger and, and said, Hey man, stories are really important in this journey. So, well, yeah. And, well, the, and the part of the reason that stories are so useful is that they're told in a linear fashion, right? I mean, we're time bound linear thinking beings. So when you give me a list of facts and figures about how great your thing is, my brain has to shuffle it, organize it, think what to do with it. And usually what to do with it is get it off, uh, you know, sort it, get, get it out of the way. But when you, when you start by telling somebody a story, you're giving them a time and a place. Ooh, you know, three or four weeks ago, I was talking to a client just like you, Chris, and this problem had, they had problems very similar to you. And here's what I did for them. And all of a sudden, I'm comfortable and paying attention, and it's a lot easier for my brain to grit, to grab what you're saying. So, uh, and, you know, the idea, stories could just be little short things, but they're meaningful and they connect. I love it. And it's interesting, it's interesting to me, because you've talked about how you've mastered storytelling and, and in the radio business, and then you've used that throughout your different business aspects. Um, the What's interesting to me is is how even if you don't uh, – even if you have a story in life, um, you, you sometimes don't find value in it. You're like, well, that's a great story, hmm, whatever. But then sometimes it comes back to you. So um, uh, a good example of that is uh, years ago, uh, when I was a kid, I read Where the Red Fern Grows. Because when I was a kid, probably like you, uh, everyone read Where the Red Fern Grows, The Hobbit, and I think the uh, the dog guy who knew uh, hand, uh, uh Han Solo. <laughs> now that's stuck in my brain. Just made a movie, the Jack Wild, the Wild books. Jack Wild. Uh, it... Yeah, not Shel Silverstein, but um, the other cool guy. Call the, the cool Wild. No, Call the Wild. Yeah. Call wow, the wild. How am I not? I'm, I'm not thinking of this. Terrible. <laughs> it's the Corona. Where the wild, where the wild things are. That was the name of it. Where yeah, that, that was the other one. Um, that was a big one. Yeah, that everyone read. Um, uh, but uh, uh, Harrison Ford just. He got just into a movie. There'll probably be a whole series because that gentleman wrote a ton of books. And I remember reading him as a kid. But I read Where the Red Fern Grows. And I read it a couple times. I love that book. And and then I put it aside. Um, decades later, we one of my companies, we hired some employees who'd been uh, fired from a, a competing company. We hired them. It turns out they had a uh, employment contract. Um and it was kind of an interesting shakedown because the gal had actually tried to date me. We gone out to a business dinner and I thought it was to buy our company. She thought it was a date. So it was a little weird. So I guess to get back at me for not following up on dating her, cause she was, she was like Donald Trump. She was a lying psycho. Um, uh, and so she decided to sue us over taking these employees. What I didn't know she was doing, she was doing information checking to see if I had money. And so she was a shakedown lawsuit basically. Mm. over these employees we hired over a non-compete agreement so she sued us and one of the great stories that i'm putting in my book is the story of how i won the lawsuit and actually her and her attorneys ended up suing her for their money uh (laughs) because i'd read where the red fern grows and uh so um uh, long story short basically there's a there's a thing in where the red fern grows where uh they would catch raccoons to get their skins back in the day uh, and they would carve a hole in a log and they would make it so that the hole, the, the opening of the hole was smaller than the inside of the hole inside the log, if that makes any sense. Sure. And, and so what the raccoon would do, and, and they'd put a piece of tin that could barely fit through the hole in there. So the raccoons naturally being, you know, little shithead curious is they would stick their hand in and grab the piece of tin. But once they got their hand on the tin, they couldn't get out the hole. <clears throat> they were stuck in the hole. And the lesson I learned from that was uh, if you sue me, you're stuck in a lawsuit with me. I'm not being sued. You're stuck in it with me until we both agree to let it go. That was a very powerful thing. And it changed the dynamic of the lawsuit. Uh, where I said, we'll flip it the other way. It changed the negotiation, uh, which is pretty dynamic and in, in, in my book, but it's how we won the lawsuit. And if it mm. wasn't for that story, learning that as a child and, 
And of course, my my attorneys were throwing me to the fee wolves of just billing me per hour and draining me dry. Um, <clears throat> in the end, uh, I think it cost us ten thousand, but because I learned that she was stuck in a lawsuit with us, it cost her fifty thousand. <laughs> And, Sounds like uh, my last divorce. <laughs> <laughs> that's just a, you need to go to that again. You're not losing enough money there. That's a, that's a drop in the bucket for a divorce, man. <laughs> <laughs> I got friends that are hundreds of, they're almost half a million dollars. So well, the you, numbers, uh, the, 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 the ratio <laughs> is what I'm after with the lawyer. Oh, okay. There so, you go. See, I, I've been looted plenty. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> you oh, try man. again, man. You just need to keep up in that Annie. That's why people get married multiple times. <laughs> Hey, my wife and I, my current wife and I figured it out. We are on lucky seven between us. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. I, you know what? There's a story there somewhere about romance and belief in something. So, uh, but, but the, you're the, what you just say is so important because you learned a lesson over a long period of time through a story that your brain held onto. And when the time was ready, it just replayed that tape for you. There's yep. no way that we can do that with facts and figures. It's, yep. it's, it's just to the vast majority of us, that stuff doesn't stay available. And, and the thing so I, the, go ahead. No, well, I was just going to say the lessons we learned from our mom, from our dad, a lot of them, I mean, uh, I'm certainly not a religious guy, but what we get out of the, uh, what's available in the Bible are the parables, story, 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 story. Yeah. Uh, true or not, they're stories. And, yeah. and, and that's how we're, you know, we're one of the more painful things. There's a rush to storytellers now online and, and wired for story is makes me flinch a little bit, but it's true. The best way to get somebody's attention is, Oh, Oh, Chris. Yeah. That's interesting. Let me tell you a little story about that. It's definitely people listen in. I mean, this is the whole reason I never really realized why we consume stories or I never thought they were very important to me. I was very linear in what I wanted and I was I was like, I'm going for this and I want to be rich. I want to be the CEO of my own company someday and, you know, have this money and success. And to me, like everything was expendable outside of that thing. Mm -hmm. The one thing I always had was I always had an intellectual curiosity. Maybe it was, maybe it was because of the way I was raised and, and uh, I, or maybe it was just my personality. But one of the things I always had um, was the love of stories. And I never really, I just never knew it. I just kind of liked them. And so for me, I would come home every day to, uh, I, I remember this one example with one of my great girlfriends. She was really nice, but it just didn't work out. And I would come home every day and I would be like, Hey man, check out these stories. And I have all these stories from work. You know, I had a hundred employees. So there was always like, you know, there was always stories going on that I could come home with, but I was intellectually curious. I was always listening and, and she worked for Delta and she was like the head of uh, um, the head of uh, the management for the flight attendants. And anytime they called in six, she'd have to go do the things. And she was a really nice gal. I'm not knocking her in any way, shape, or form. But she, when she would come home, I would tell my stories. And then I'd be like, what stories do you got? And she'd be like, nothing. And I'd be like, wait, you went to three cities today? You travel with hundreds of people on a, on a big boat in the sky? <laughs> and you don't have any stories? Like nothing stood out to you? And she's like, no, nothing. And so I've always been curious about these people that can go through the world. Um, and I found this growing up in a cult, it's religion and stuff and, and a lot of other things where people go through this life in kind of this robotic nature where they don't, mm -hmm. they don't really th see what's going on. And I've been guilty of that as well throughout my life where I'm not paying attention and I'm not enjoying the journey, if you will. And so, uh, and so that always used to madden me. In fact, one, at one point, I finally said to her, it was kind of funny. I, I said, you know, I think I'm going to pay to have someone kidnap you and just hold you hostage for like a day just so I can have a fucking story. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, you're an asshole. And she was right. I'm, I was a horrible person. It's a good thing uh, she didn't end up with me. Um, <laughs> in fact, I think most of my Just a little extreme. I, I will say it's a little extreme. I, I thought it was more funny. I mean, she's going through life. This is what's this is what bums me out because I'm wired completely to be fascinated by what else is going yeah. on around me. Like my dad, my grandfather. I come from a family of nosy people. Not in your business, but hmm, wow, really? How does that work? And it's just so interesting. People have these 
amazingly complex lives going on and they do things and they know all these different things have been to different places. And you can find out all of these secrets by looking at them like this and saying, wow, yeah, tell me more, tell me more. And I think the reason we love stories is because life doesn't come with a manual. So these are the only ways we can learn. I mean, there's the old saying that, uh, and I, I think I've amended it. I think my version is, is the, the one thing man can learn from his history is that man never learns from his history. Um, and that's the real problem of why we keep repeating, why we keep failing. There's no, there's no manual. And um, I've just always been curious. And so the thing I've espoused recently to my ne- niece and nephew who are just starting their lives at 18 is I said, look, be intellectually curious. Be curious about life. Collect stories. Uh, learn stuff. I remember watching Steve Jobs. I think it was at one of his commencement speeches. It's kind of a famous speech, but he talks about how he was failing at school, but he was kind of interested in learning about fonts and and uh, lettering and 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 the whole thing behind the different. Uh, I forget what it's called, um, but he was really interested in that. So he took that class because he was interested, even though he didn't give a shit and he probably failed at it. But that made him he put that information in the first Apple computer and that's what put the foundation down for the, for the Mac and his success with Apple. And if it hadn't been for that, you kind of have to wonder where that would gone. And so, you know, he basically says, you know, you'll be surprised at what stories and what lessons you'll learn in life that you won't actively use now, but you'll use later. And you'll be like, wow, I'm so glad I learned that from a long time ago. Right. And, and, and it stays, it's like a little tape ready to play. Uh, I, I, you know, we're having a little concern around the world with coronavirus and I don't play the tape of fear in my head, you know, for whatever reasons, what I play very clearly is my mother telling me, go have a couple of vitamin C and drink a nice glass of water. Like that was her cure for everything. So I am prepared for the pandemic because my mother already told me a story. Go have a couple of vitamin C and a nice glass of water. There you go. There you, you go. Know, but, but that's that story, because when I was a kid, right, that's just the same. But the story is when I was a kid, I go take the vitamin C, not get sick. This gave me, uh, you know, some sort of immunity, whether it's psychological. You know, I'm a big, big fan of, uh, uh, you know, is, is it really a vitamin or is it a placebo? I don't care. I think the message is from my hand to my brain today we're doing something good for ourselves and break to our sponsors today brought to you by vitamin c energy uh you can find it your local walmart (laughs) well you you can buy it at costco (laughs) with the five pounds of or five tons of toilet paper that you just bought so not to make light of coronavirus but why are people buying toilet paper? I don't get it. I have no idea. I, I went to get some disinfectant, and I am an occasional Costco shopper, and uh, they had nothing. So yeah. I walked out with a giant bottle of uh, American Kirkland vodka for like eleven ninety nine for five gallon size. It's because it's good to disinfect the inside of you as well. Well, you know, I haven't had a glass of vodka in a dozen years. I don't intend to have one right now. But I have a friend who told me a story about how it is an excellent natural cleaner if you want to wipe down your counters and stuff like that. Oh, well, there you go. There you go. I was actually reading because so many people are buying Perel that uh, I guess there's recipes you can get. And if you have Everclear and you have isopropyl alcohol, I think it is. You can mix the two. I'm not sure that's just keep it away from an open flame. Uh, right. <laughs> but you could mix the two. And uh, then you've also got something to drink for the kids, you know. They can lay I, off the Tide Pods for a week. I do love a, a YouTube video story about <laughs> fighting disease that begins with, so if you have a bottle of Everclear, Everclear. laying around. <laughs> yeah, that, you haven't, I, that you haven't finished. <laughs> I had some Everclear one time at a Fat Tuesdays in Key West, Florida, and I think I went to jail that day. No, just <laughs> uh, this just didn't. Uh, this is so awesome sauce. So stories are important. Tell us more about what you get. You do a lot of consulting work. You do a lot of uh, different coaching with with businesses and, and people in business. Uh, give us a little yeah. bit of insight into how you do that and what you do. Well, um, what I find is. Um, everybody is aware that video really is the thing, right? I mean, all I can cite statistics and this and that, but the truth is 
people are watching this little device and, and they're watching it like this close, right? Like you're watching a video on your phone. You're kind of like, Hey man, now I don't know about you, but that's pretty personal. Did you spend five minutes looking at your spouse this close today? Uh, so, <laughs> Wait, I have a spouse? <laughs> right, yeah. Good news. I do. And I better go spend five minutes doing this. Hi, you're awesome. Yeah. Uh, but but the, the point is, it's an intimate connection. And if you're just really being human and telling a story about some future goodness, right? Like you're, the, the story that we want to sell to, uh, in, in a selling environment is of a future uh, wonderful state of being that you're going to attain when you buy our thing, learn our thing, do, do, what, you know, do what we do, whatever, whatever it is. I, I work with people to just do a simple selling message for start, right? Hi, I am. We do this thing, whatever that is, for these types of people so they get this awesome result. So when I'm hearing the story, we do this thing. Oh, well, that thing, that's, that's something. I'm interested in that thing for these types of people. Ooh, people just like me, right? When you're telling me the story and then you, you, you finish the story with, and they get this awesome result and the listener hears, I would like that result too. And then you're so you called to people. action. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, then your call to action is let's see if it's a fit. Give me a call. I mean, it's it's not sell, sell, sell. Yep. It, it, it's you got to tell a story. I mean, it's what you got to do on a date before you go for the uh, first, second, third, or base. You got to tell stories and get that gal interested in your in your in your life, um, or you, I suppose, maybe not your <laughs> life. Um, but uh, you know, brands are doing that nowadays, and it sounds like you're doing a lot of coaching. That's the one of the reasons I invited you on the show is because your videos are done really well compared to mine. Um, and, uh, and, and they present very well. And I, I love how animated you are in your stories too. That makes them very interesting visually because I've seen people that do the videos where like they're very stoic and they're just like, Rrr. you know, part of the animation or part of the, when people are watching a video is, 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 is making it interesting and keeping their interest. I think that's the biggest challenge that everybody has, including brands or myself, is keeping that interest. You watch your, you, watch, you know, you go on YouTube, you watch your fall off of video watches, and you're like, what did I do wrong? Right. And, and you know, part of that, videos, videos evolving, and I think becoming more and more important. But as it becomes broader, people, do, you know, doing more and more, what we're doing is we're getting a lot of this, jiggly hand motion <laughs> handheld i mean if you're going to use your phone to make a video about your business that is awesome go spend 150 bucks on a gimbal oh my god it's exactly. critical yeah so there you know there are some things to do like that but the the idea unfortunately our brains are getting a little bit twisted from the hollywood movies right i am not a huge movie goer anymore. I was for many, many years. The last thing I went was the Terminator thing where the universe ends. I was exhausted after that freaking movie. I mean, at one point I kind of closed my ears. I'm in one of these theaters. Uh, here's how much I don't go to the movies. You know, theaters have big seats that recline and they're like easy chairs and you put giant mm -hmm. cups in it. It's a very nice environment. But every three, four, six seconds at the most is a gigantic scene change, right? It's yeah. just whipping your brain all over so you pay attention well on a video that you're doing to talk about your business there has to be some element of that because this would be people becoming used to so the idea that you would when I, there's videos of me that are just like i lock because that was the thing i thought i needed to do and it'd be like hello i have spent a lot of time memorizing this no teleprompter no looking down at a note no and there are some regrettable things. I spent a lot of time as a sales trainer. So uh, earlier, a lot of my videos tended to be very dictatorial and this is what you should do and this and that. So anything's okay. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, he, he, here's why a story works. One of, one of the first real huge examples I had, I worked with a guy in Daytona Beach, Florida, a really fun town to be in the radio business, especially rock radio. I worked at a station called The Hog, baby. And so that's a pretty cool place to work when it's bike week and women are taking off their clothes because they're drunk. Hey, but folks. there's a guy to so stick to the story. This guy is, 
uh, had a restaurant he had bought and he had sold this restaurant to a few people over the few years I'd been around. They all failed. He took the restaurant back. He opens up the restaurant. He calls it Whiskey Pete. He sells wings. It's a bar, right? It's a bar that sells food. And he didn't believe in radio and he didn't believe in advertising, blah, blah, blah. Well, I really was on this guy because I knew it was a good fit for my listeners. So we made him, his name was John DeGiulio. His name is actually still John DeGiulio. But everybody to this day, almost, it's more than 15 years later, probably almost 20, people still call the guy Whiskey Pete because we made him come in the studio. We introduced him as Whiskey Pete. And then we told a story about why his wings were good. And he would say, oh, the secret to our wings is we deep fry them, then we knock off the grease and throw them on the grill. And he told that little vignette, what does that do? That creates a visual right in your head. I'm hungry now. Right? The wings come out of the greasy fryer. We knock the grease off. Oh, man. For those listening to the podcast, I am wiggling my hand around, knocking the grease off, and then throw on the grill. And that became a thing he said. And people would come into the restaurant. You could have them made like that, or you could have them made regular. And mm-hmm. people would come in and they would order and they would say, now I want you to knock the grease off and throw them on the grill. <laughs> and this is 20 years ago we started doing this. And I'm telling you the story now. That sticks in your head for a long time. And you know, it, it really does. It's it's kind of funny. Um, I was going to do a bit there. The, uh, hey, 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 folks, thanks for tuning in to K-Log here in Daytona K-Log. Beach. Yeah, right, it's... Uh, it's uh, 11.46, uh, almost the top of the hour. We've got uh, weather and traffic coming to you here. Coming up. Uh, that, that radio station was a perfect, uh, the announcer guy, you know, the guy who did the, you're listening to the hog. He, the had hog. A, he made you sound like, like a, you know, a schoolgirl. This guy was just, so he, he had a voice twice as deep as yours. And he was half my size. I mean, this little skinny dude showed up, but he talked like this. Yeah, I was lucky to grow up with, uh, was it the werewolf? The wolf? Yeah, you listen to the, the wolf man. The wolf you man. Must have been the here. Yeah. You listen to the wolf man now. Yeah. Wolf man Jack. Wolf man Jack. And yeah. then uh, Dr. Demento. I was a big Dr. Demento fan. Oh, yeah. Up. Big Dr. Demento fan. And you know what? I never, when I ever realized about radio, because uh, here in Utah, when I grew up as a kid, the, the, the we had some really great radio station DJs and they had a team of two or three people and they they had uh, characters um, that were kind of like a lot of a bit like the South Park people and South Park wasn't around then but uh, they were like little kitty voices that were funny but uh, I never realized that most of that shit was scripted beforehand like I never I never knew that a lot of radio is scripted like I just thought those guys are brilliant at just coming up with that shit and then bouncing off each other with the thing the improv and then later I met a DJ and he's like that's all scripted Chris we all write that shit <laughs> I'm like what no like, you ruined it well there I think there's some of both yeah, but I was probably, it's probably a bit some of both. I, I, I was just all my stuff so I always made stuff up I mean some guys walk <laughs> through life making stuff up I was uh, saddened to discover my friend is a comedy writer. One of my ch- childhood friends, a comedy writer in LA. And one of the things he does is he writes the little bits mm-hmm. when a movie star goes on like Jimmy Fallon or, you know, or, or Kimmel, like all oh, that scripted too. And I'm like, really? I yeah. was actually fallen for that. Just being clever banter. Yeah. So did I, I did, I had no idea. And that's why we do a pre-show on the Chris Voss show. Uh, because I, I learned that on those shows, they actually have a pre-producer that goes in and I'm too cheap to hire one, but they have a producer that goes in sits down with the guests and goes, you know, we want to go over and what's the thing. And, and so you think it's that beautiful banter, but it's all cute and you know, it's on the right. index well, cards, but they have uh, a bigger budget than you. They have and I, I had the same experience. I w- you know, I used to listen to a lot of Stern back when he was funnier. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, and, um, uh, uh, what's his face was on the show, the comedian. I kind of left the show after when he left. Um, Jackie. Jackie no, Martin. fuck Jackie. Um, although Jackie is funny. I mean, come on. Anybody who can write for penthouse jokes is uh, good in my book, at least from my age of childhood. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, Artie Lang. Artie uh, Lang. I loved Artie. Artie Lang on the show. In fact, I think I was tuning in more for Artie than, than, uh, than uh, the thing. And so I was early doing the Chris Voss show podcast. 
And uh, I remember Stern was doing this thing where he'd do the NBC. He was making, you know, a parody fun of his old NBC days when he, they used to force him to do the call out letters, at the top of the hour and the bottom of the hour and the time and the weather. And, you know, right. so, he would, you know, federal law, but okay. Yeah. Is Stern. it federal yeah. law? Wow. Okay. Um, yeah, top of the hour, ID. Absolutely. You must get your weather. God damn it. Or we'll, you, you'll be in jail. Very weird laws. <laughs> so, so he would do the NBC. So I was fucking around with it on a couple of shows and I did welcome to the Chris Voss show, the Chris Voss show dot com. And I just like randomly sing it different. And I did that for like a week or two. And then I stopped because I was like, that was just a bit, you know, it's done. I kind of did it. And I got this call from a guy in Canada and he's like, Hey man, why'd you stop doing the, the singing part of the show? And I'm like, well, it's just, just, it was just a bit, it got done. And he's like, no, man, that's the best. You got to keep doing that. And I'm like, are you fucking serious? <laughs> like, are you serious? It's- and so now when people come up to me, people started coming up to me going, the Chris Foss show. I mean, they run up to me at events, everywhere I go, all my fucking friends, when they come up, they're like, the Chris Foss show, the Chris Foss show, they come, ah! and you're just like, holy shit. Now I can't ever do a musical intro or anything because. People, uh, people remember like it. it's it's a little yeah. audio it's an audio mnemonic but it's also that little that little hook of the story it triggers in them a series mm-hmm. of other things and and it, i mean it's it, i'm the same way i'm like I, just, oh, sure. I almost interrupted you when you're doing the intro to go wow i'm seeing it done live this is so cool <laughs> oh, but, you yeah. know but people just they, they just they love that you know they love they that do. i mean i have people jump up to me they'll just come walking up to me in a crowd and be like the chris Voss show and you're like who are the fuck are you, man? Yeah. And you're well, like, Don't and, and stab it, me. <laughs> it, it's just a way to really draw a, diff, a, a different kind of line, right? Like yeah. all of a sudden that's, ooh, I know they make a positive association. When I was with a radio station in Daytona Beach, the morning show guy, Frank Scott, the man with two first names, Frank Scott thought it was very funny to make fun of the sales guy who was generally hung over and would call in in the morning. That was me. <laughs> And uh, so I, one day I made the mistake of saying, you know, I like to think of myself as the local sales stud. And he said, what was that? Sales slug? Hey, slug. That's what we're going to call you. Oh, no, so in that moment, I oh, became wow. the sales slug. Mm-hmm. Uh, my first wife was in the radio, was in the billboard business. And as a birthday present, she put up four billboards around Daytona Beach that had the radio station logo my picture and the sales slug in the middle, <laughs> which is awesome and expensive. If you don't have a wife in there and actually it was expensive in the end, but that part was free. Uh, to this day, there are people, and this is 20 years ago to this day, there are people who will come up to me and go slug. You realize I mean, Mike, I'm never going to be able to look at your name ever again or see you ever again without thinking of slug. It's going to be Mike. I got to remember Mike. I'm going to delete this story. Oh. Yeah. I got to, I, I got to remember not to, this is so good news. <laughs> like, last time go. I'm ever going to tell this story. Go. It's, go. On the, it's on the Chris Voss show. You'll never Chris, hear that. Not publish this video. <laughs> <laughs> but, so but slug. It, I mean, it, that, it, that should be, that's a book right there. I don't know well, if it's a movie, but it's a book. It was a hook. And because of the hook of the morning show talking about the sales slug and billboards up around town for, you know, briefly, people would now call the radio station. They wouldn't say, I'd like to talk to somebody about advertising. Mm -hmm. They would say, I'd like to talk to the sales slug, please. (laughs) So I went from being, I got all the call-ins. Yeah. No one wants to call the sales department. They want to call the sales slug. They want to call the sales slug. So everybody did. It was my story i told it well uh and it was easier to give me a, a big promotion to regional sales manager than to argue with me about this kind of stuff there you so, go i mean you're not gonna you got to give the sales slug a raise because he's the sales slug but no you you just uh, educated me on a new term audio mnemonic i mnemonic i, I flunked english ding. so I how mean, important is that to uh, how important is that to you know what you advise your clients and and tell them to put in their videos and stuff well, I think it's, uh, it is important to have some sort of consistency. And that's why I, I really encourage people to get, to, to get a simple selling message down, right? Because as soon as you follow this little, the, the format of I do this thing for these kinds of people so they get this result, 
when you're filling in those blanks about whatever your business is, they're creating a movie in their head based on events that have happened that are positive that are similar to what you're saying, right? And by keeping that consistent or by using, you know, by using that same, some sort of mnemonic, some sort of clever little saying, some sort of subhead, it just gives people a, a, a way to categorize you, a way to remember you, a way to, you know, kind of draw a, a little connection to you. So it's, it's, it's important um, to have fun with it. Would you say it's close to your elevator pitch? I mean, that got big a couple of years ago with the elevator pitch. Yes, I think it's it's elevator pitchy, but longer. Uh, sometimes, sometimes if that feels really too elevator pitchy, uh, what I like about the we do we do this thing is what I call that opening. We do these things uh, is all about you, right? So if you were a guy who's uh, uh, it's hard to, to to make something up, but let's say let's say I consult to podcasters. You know, I would want to, I would want to not say, hi, I'm Mike. I am the number one consultant to podcasters in the whole freaking world. They give me a lot of money and I give great advice because nobody cares about me, but they care about those themselves. So if I'm, a, if, if, if I tell a little story that, that is, I help podcasters just like Chris Voss build their audience way above 400,000 downloads. They already got to 400 million downloads, blah, blah, blah. So they become rich and successful and their life is fabulous and they drive the car they want and they're able to thumb back at their past and go, look, I win. All of a sudden people are, you know, all right, that might be a little long. But. <laughs> no, no, it's very true. That's what I do every time I get uh, asked to come back to the my high school audience. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not. <laughs> well, it's um, a connection. Right. It, it, it's yeah. that it will remember not may, might not be the clever little advertising jingle like Winston tastes good. Like, uh, fill it in. Well, Winston cigarette. tastes good. Like, uh, the, the brain's gone, man. It's 53. Well, man. so this it's would gone. be an awesome way to prove my point. If you had said Winston tastes good, like a ding cigarette should. Oh, like, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the, yeah. it's the, it's the dementia kicking in, man. Yeah. I'm losing well, it. It's also I think it's a voluntary it's dementia though. <laughs> That are, it's, it's the damage from all that drinking <laughs> when I was younger. But, uh, no, it is interesting how much, how much of those jingles uh, stick with you, like jingles from, you know, going back to way back when and how much, how much like, when you think about a brand, you're, you, the jingle comes to your head. Um, I mean, even and, – and Intel was the first one when I, I was in the radio business at the dawn of the computer age. And Intel, uh, co-op advertising is where somebody will pay for a chunk of your ad because you mentioned their company. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, car dealer, the most obvious example, supermarket ads, we see all the pictures, that's co-op advertising. Mm -hmm. If you include us in your ad, we'll give you a little bit of money to pay for the ad. Intel was giving 75% co-op, meaning they pay for 75% of your ad. If you said the word Intel followed by dong, 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 that little, yeah, I can't even make the sound. I, I, Intel I, inside sound. Yeah. That little <laughs> Intel inside sound, that's all they asked for. All you have to do is say Intel inside, boom, 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 and they gave you money. Yeah. And here I am. It's been a long time since I heard that. We're telling the story. See the, So those are good hooks. Mm -hmm. But the stories that you, that you tell become so ingrained after a while mm -hmm. uh, and promise some sort of benefit that uh, – here's a, here's a good one. When I was in Daytona Beach, NASCAR was a client. NASCAR had a big fancy uh, uh, entertainment thing that they built just then called Daytona USA, which was kind of like a museum attraction. And there was a big gift shop called Daytona 2000 because – that was in the future back then. And uh, so my buddy ran the store. He said, hey, I was in there on my birthday. He said, hey, you know, you like those model cars that we have. I, it's not actually here. I thought it might be my office. You like those model cars. You know, the $100 kind mm -hmm. with the metal that come on the block with the top and the doors open. Mm -hmm. And I uh, had wanted a, at the time, you know, sales guy like you, right? Goals, goals. And I said, when I turn 40, I'm going to buy a black 911 with cash goal. And I knew that goal when I was talking to this guy, he didn't have a black nine 11. He had a silver one. 
Turns out I didn't buy one at 40. I bought a divorce instead, more expensive and more worth it. But I used that car model that he gave me that day on my desk. I was doing sales training for, you know, younger guys. And you can't really say, do this and you'll be able to have a good lifestyle in a house because they're young. They don't have a lifestyle in a house. They have, you know, beer and chasing women. In. But I would say, look, if you do this, if you have fun in this career, you can really open the doors to whatever you would like. For instance, this car, you could have this car. And I would use the model to tell a story about future success. And the story basically was, if you work hard, you will have this car and you will be successful. Okay. That's a nice story. And it worked. And people were like, yeah, go team, go sell ads, make money, <laughs> woohoo, have fun. And after a while, I, I changed jobs. The thing went in a, in, a, in, a, in a car, in a box somewhere, never to be seen again. Fast forward more than 10 years. Let's say 10 years. Fast forward 10 years. I walk into my friend has a car dealership. He specializes in high-end used cars here in Northern California. So my wife is out shopping for a car, not me. And we go in to see a car dealer that we know, like, and trust, of course. And there is a car. And I'm like, are you kidding? <gasps> I'm really not that much of a car guy. I'm a camera guy. I love gear, but I'm not like a big car head. And I had to have this car. And I was like, oh, my God, that's like a weird reaction. So I, I, I actually kind of left. I'm like, hey, Laurent. I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah, I got to go. Right. But I somehow needed this car and I left. And I had said, if I get a big check from a client that I was expecting, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, my wife as a surprise winds up taking that big check from a client and going to uh, buy the car. Oh, nice. And because she's awesome like that. I mean, like, how does it, I mean, what's that about? That is the kind of woman I'm. Only problem is the car was for her. Oh, no, I'm oh. just kidding. Well, here's where it gets really weird. I don't even know how to drive a freaking stick shift. I lived in Florida for years and years. Uh, I live in California now. You have to know how to operate a stick shift on a hill. I do not, at the time, possess that knowledge. But the weird thing is, about two weeks later, she's under the stairs in that secret closet digging through some old stuff, and she pulls out, and she goes, wow, what the hell is this? And it's the model of the car. Mm. That model of the convertible Porsche that the guy gave me in 1999 at Daytona International Speedway is exactly the car that I bought. It's the same make, model, year. It has the same custom rims on the side. It has the same sport seats. It's a convertible. It's the same color combination. Holy it is crap. not kind of like that car. It is the exact car that I had told my brain a story. If you have this car, you'll be successful. When you're successful, you can have this car. My brain set up a loop that played quietly in the background until I saw the car. So it's kind of like the car was your, your, uh, an early stage before vision boards, basically. Yes. Yeah, exactly. There you go. So that's what stories do. Yeah. And it's interesting. I've had the same thing with goals in my life where I've set goals and, and, and then I'll go back and I actually have some of my original goals that I wrote when I was like 18 or 20 it was amazing to me. I'm like, holy shit, that came true. Um, but to tie all this together, um, being in business and telling stories and telling your story, your elevator pitch is so important. When I go to these shows and I do interviews on the podcast or just interviews on the podcast, um, I'll have CEOs that will tell me, well, um, I don't know, what's, what's, what do you want to talk about? And I'm like, you, what's your story? Why, why are you here? Well, I don't know. You just reminded me in the pot. Well, I mean, do you have an elevator pitch, dude? <laughs> I'll be like, do you have an elevator pitch? Dude? And they'll be like, oh, yeah, an elevator pitch. Oh, yeah. Kind of. And I'm like, how are you a fucking CEO? Because, like, all my life as a CEO, I, this is, this is, you know, people always just will say to me sometimes when they see me on lists of success and whatever in social media and four bucks will buy you a cup of coffee too. Um, and they'll be like, oh, you just got on the internet early with Twitter or whatever. I didn't actually. When I, when I was a CEO, I knew and learned early when I trained to be a CEO that I had to sell everyone. I had to sell the employees. I had to sell the investors, the board, uh, everybody I was doing business with, my vendors and why they should work with us and give us discounts. And, and I was always having to sell to everyone. It, it, mm-hmm. you just, it's not, you're not a mon- Some people get this idea that if you're a CEO, you're just a monolith who sits around and I don't know, eats cookies all day or something. Right, yeah, no. In a big office. <laughs> That's not the and way it works. <laughs> just go, mm, 
You know, I always love when people used to say to me, it's great that you can do what you want or you can, you know, you, you, you're the CEO and you can just do whatever you want. You're actually, no, I'm actually chained to a giant big ball. It's a very gilded cage. Right. But um, I'm amazed at how many CEOs don't know their own story or have a story or know what story they're telling. And you're kind of like, well, that's probably why you're a little lost. Um, right. And so right. to tie all this together, being a CEO, being a marketing person in sales, having a story to tell and be able to tell it well, you know, you got to have it down as to what your story is and being able to communicate it. And in today's nanosecond world, in this uh, low attention span world, you've got to be able to bang that baby out and it's got to be quick and concise and right to the point because in five seconds, you're going to lose people. Right. Well, there's your story as a CEO, which is about you and your journey and your company and, and can be very fascinating. Perhaps more interesting, though, is the story of your customer who's kind of like the prospect that you want to tell the story to. So I don't really care about what you claim. I, I spent a long time in the advertising business and I get it, but that has changed now and people don't trust advertising. That's the true, last, huh? The last absolute claim that you could depend on from an advertising, you know, from an ad on TV, I think the final straw that broke my back was when it turned out that VW has been lying about the emissions. <laughs> like, that's just a simple thing. Yeah. We have no context for. The car gets 50 miles a gallon. Okay, that's nice. But you're lying about that, so I don't believe any freaking thing. But yeah. when you tell me a story, oh, you know, you tell me about a story that you is real about a real customer who came to you with a problem, right? And people are not coming just to hand you, you and your business money. I have exactly. a problem. You have a solution. Here's money. Freaking handle it. So let me tell you about a guy who came to me with a pile of money and a problem. He handed it to me and I solved it. Does this resonate with you? Do you have the same problem? Do you look like the same guy? Now, I don't need to know about you at all. I just need to know about you solve this guy's problem. And if you solved his problem, you can solve my problem. So one of the most important stories you can tell is the customer story. What did mm -hmm. they get? Oh, that's you awesome. Know? And a lot of people have to, they struggle my story, my, you know, this Joseph Campbell idea of the mono myth where you're going to work where one story is the whole story. And you try to make all stories fit into this cycle of essentially star Wars and, and it's not like that. It could just be a cool thing that happened. Yeah. You know, that's what people remember. Um, and when you tell me a story about your customer who had good results, it's true. Yeah. I, it reads true in my head. And so oh, everything else falls away. Where did you go to college? I don't give a shit. You got an award? I don't give a shit. What can you do for me? That's all. So, and and I, I, love, I love that you make that distinction because – um, that's what a lot of people don't get. And that's what a lot of people are looking for. And, and I think you're 10,000% right in that people are so jaded nowadays with advertising and false advertising. They, they literally don't believe. And um, one of the most important things I learned, because I'll meet people and they'll be like, I want to be an entrepreneur someday. Why? Um, I don't know. So I'm work my eyes and get well, that's not, that's not going to make it for you. Um, the, and, and people will be like, well, how do I become an entrepreneur? And, and I'll be like, you basically solve people's problems. Sometimes it's your own problem that you solve. And then you find out that exponentially everyone has the same problem. You resolve their problems as well. You know, right. you use a product and you're like, I don't like the, re the way this cup doesn't have handles. It's really hard to hold. Oh, I should put a handle on it. And it's exponential as to how many different variations or innovations you can make to anything. Like one of the things I used to uh, do in my business um, was, you know, there's always a way to prove everything, even after you improve it multiple times. And uh, one of the most important things I learned uh, listening to Earl Nightingale when I was a kid was he tells a story, and I won't tell the story here. I think I've told it before, but you can look it up. But he, he tells a story about US, a U.S. Steel consultant. And basically the story is is that if it, the, the, the result of the story or the lesson is that if you can figure out a way to solve people's problems, they will pay you uh, exponentially based on the value of the return of the problems that you're solving. And that's what you do as an entrepreneur. You're a right. problem solver. And right. if you look at that from a problem solving CEO basis, then you tend to find a lot of information because then you start asking yourself questions, which are really important as well. And you go, 
how do I solve someone's problems? Or uh, maybe you have a product that's already launched, but then you're like, how do we better solve people's problems? Or how do we improve what we're doing to solve more problems? Right. Or sometimes you have a product that's aimed at one problem that you're solving. And then you hear from your customers, you know, you have a really great problem product, but if you could solve a few of these other things over here, that'd be great too, if you can make them inclusive. And then you go, okay, well, how do we, how do we pull this in? You know, uh, Steve Jobs was probably a good example of that where he took, you know, seven or eight different things that we all had as individual media uh, hardware pieces, and he just went <laughs> and squished right. it all into a phone. I remember Andy Grignon, a friend of mine uh, who worked on the iPhone, telling me, you know, we're trying to put a phone into a, this little device. <laughs> we're trying to put a fax machine in there, and we're trying to put a, you know, voicemail and, and a printer and all this stuff. And, and, um, so, um, you know, solving people's problems and a lot of people don't look at that. And so I think it's real important the distinction you make that don't, don't tell us so much about who you are and what you're about. Um, uh, but tell us how you can solve my problems because that's usually when I go searching for something and I'm having a problem or I'm trying to figure out how to resolve it. That's what I'm searching for is right. people who had right. my problem and got it fixed. You know, well, that's, 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 that's exactly right. I, and I'm jumping in on you here, but I, this is the keyest point. When people, people have problems, you solve problems. That's how you make money. That's how I make money. That's how everybody makes money, no matter what it is. So when people have unique problems, they're going online and searching for a solution. That's what people do. That's what YouTube is for. Mm -hmm. right? People go to YouTube to learn and they type in, how do I do this thing? Mm -hmm. And a, a great story to tell isn't about how great am I? The great story to tell is, you know, hey, I'm Mike, as a video coach, one of the questions I hear often is, how do I get more comfortable in front of the camera? Well, let me tell you a little story, blah, blah, blah. So, or uh, how do I simply make a video to, and quickly post it to Facebook? Well, let me tell you a little story about how that's done. So they're typing in YouTube or Google for an answer and you have made a video with a story that is the answer to the question that they have, the solution to the problem. So that is great because it's story. That is also great because it's video. You're also way more likely to get in front of a prospect with a problem with a video than a blog post that has, you know, all kinds of all kinds of competition you're going to get people's attention with the video story quicker than anything else um, so I, I think that that kind of brings the you know the story the expertise as soon as you're starting to ask questions solve problems I, I think th those are the stories that you want to tell first those and, are the stories that come out most easily sorry <laughs> exactly and and that's the best hook and that's I think we've tied the whole story thing together now as well as to why it's important and how it can ask, uh, be part of your business and how to market it well in, in getting, um, you know, uh, the consumers to buy your product. I mean, that's, that's really, I mean, I think what we've identified is some really great ways to look at it from business sales, marketing aspect, from selling yourself. If you're just doing it as a person, you're just trying to get dates on Tinder, or uh, if you're a CEO and you're trying to do that pitch or figure out what your story is and what you're, what you're trying to push out there. People want their problems solved. I mean, it's really simple. Like, it's really simple. I, I'll tell entrepreneurs, they're like, I want to be an entrepreneur. I'm like, why? And I, I don't know. It sounds really cool. <laughs> and you're like, you have no yeah. idea. Uh, right. But uh, <laughs> just wait. Um, right. <laughs> but uh, who needs hair? Because uh, you'll pull it all out uh, or lose it. But uh, no, it's fun. But, uh, you know, you've got to have a reason. There's got to be that reason behind it. I mean, one of the challenges I've always had with all the business I've ever been in, except for the podcast, I, I love this sort of element where I can interview people and talk to people. And I can find out what makes them tick. Because to me, I'm collecting stories and I'm collecting, right. I'm collecting lessons and, and things that I learn from. And I learn from these. Um, and so, uh, so this it might be the one job I've done that I've actually really enjoyed. I've always liked being a CEO and being an investor, but I've never loved right. most of the business I've ever been in. I've never loved them. I've loved them for the money. I've loved them for the challenge of innovating them. Like I used to tell them, my board, I'm like, you know, I love being a CEO and being the guy who has to jump into the jungle in Vietnam and, you know, be the ranger who has to go, you know, cut, you know, a swath out of land so that we can, you know, bring in the camp and the troops. Um, I love that aspect of it. But, uh, um, 
being being that guy is cool, but for a lot of times I wasn't very passionate about the companies I was in. So I think it's better if you if you can find a, a business that you like, that you a problem you want to solve, and build a business around that because then you're more passionate about it. You give a shit about it. Um, yeah. And you can't, uh, you can't really sell something you don't love, right? The real pure sales is mm-hmm. the transference of energy and excitement from one person to another. Yep. So you can do your best, but unless you wake up in the morning going, man, this really can, like I have to dial back sometimes, man, video could change your whole business. If you did this, I could just see you've got a great story. You're not presenting it right. What if you did blah, 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 blah. Like I am on it and it makes so that's not always great, but it, it, you know, it makes me sometimes difficult to be around, but, but it makes, I mean, I get up to do this thing and, and I agree with you hundred percent. You can't just wander around wanting to be an entrepreneur. You have to be turned on about something. Yeah. And, and I mean, the only thing I was ever turned on was the investment and making it work and make it profitable. That was my boner. Um, but, but a lot of times it was hard because I was like, I really don't give a shit about how these things were invested in. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I enjoyed the investor part and the CEO part. So that was my aspect. But I, I highly recommend that people get into the business and they do that. And you're right. Video is so important today. People are consuming video from all sorts of different things. They're looking for entertainment. They've got their phones. So video now is being delivered in a way that, you know, when you and I grew up, if you want to watch video, you had to wait till you got home or someplace with a TV set. And then you could watch some video. Um, you know, nowadays it's consumable everywhere and people are consuming such huge amounts of it that, uh, you need to be on that, on that, on that train, man. Cause if yeah. you're not like, what world are you living in? Well, and, and, you know, we're, we're, we're shifting cause yeah, people are watching gazillion videos and a lot of times they think, well, you know, that's the kids and the gamers and this and that, but we're looking at, you know, so e-commerce last year, a trillion dollars. Oh my God. Holy cow. What a number. More interesting to me is e-training is knocking at $100 billion. So that's people who are looking to improve themselves, taking online, buying online courses, taking online courses, watching videos and learning. So that's long-form learning that people are becoming more and more interested in and watching videos. So once upon a time, maybe the idea was, ooh, get in, get out. And there's a use for that. Uh, Facebook reverts a three-minute video. Now, they give you more push with a three-minute video. So you tell a three-minute and five-second story. Uh, Average length of a video on YouTube that gets watched, 10 minutes. So if you're talking to the right person, talk, right? Mm -hmm. Like, don't try to be everything to everybody. That's not right, you know, but if you do this thing, I do this thing for these people just like you. I'm listening to this video, whether it's 20 minutes or two minutes, because it's for me. Yeah. He gets me. This guy gets me. This woman gets me. And it, it's social proof. A video of you talking on the internet with a couple of comments or whatever is social proof. And we live in a world where I make my decisions based on the last three guys who posted something to B&H photo or to Amazon or to Yelp. Like, mm-hmm. this guy's rude. Well, I'm not going there. That guy's rude. Really? This is the way you make decisions? Yes. So make it easy for me. Make it easy for people to make decisions positively about you. When I was younger, all my decisions were made by the latest issue of Playboy. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> anyway, guys, uh, just wonderful lessons we learned here from Mike Walpert. Uh, and I appreciate you being on. Anything more we need to know, Mike, from you? Uh, give us your plug so we can wrap up. We got to have you on the show again because you and I could talk for hours about this. Yeah, I'd love such to. Great information to share with us. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I, 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 don't, uh, I, I don't have necessarily something to plug or sell. I am a big fan of helping small business owners, particularly coaches, consultants, contractors, uh, create easy video. We do coaching. Uh, I do a 21-day video jumpstart. Uh, my ask is that anyone watching go, you know what? I have one of these things. Let's see if I can start telling a little story. I had a call from a guy earlier today who said, well, I'm really uncomfortable and shy in front of the camera. What should I do about that? Practice. Sit there in your office. Go, hi, my name is Mike. I do this thing for these people. Ooh, I hate that. Delete. And do it again. And do it again. And then someone will say, yeah, it's good enough. We're shooting for good enough. 
and post it. And people will go, oh, you're awesome. And you go, yay, I can do this. It's just like that. We're yes. all cheering each other on. And in finality, if I may, the idea right now in the world of social media, there's so much negative shit. It's terrible. Mm -hmm. So when you have something positive to say, people will share it, right? We're all looking for, you know, like it's, we're never going to get back to the Facebook good old days where it was all cat memes and, and, and flash mobs. Damn but it. when Damn you it. put up something that is positive, people will share it. So put up something positive, let people share it. Go there tell some go. stories, get some customers, grow your business have the revenue flow in. So your life becomes extraordinary. Your mortgage is paid. Your children are smart. Your wife is better looking all from telling stories on video. Wait, your wife gets better looking from stories. <laughs> no, I wish I didn't include that. In oh my... boy. All right. Well, there we go. Now lessons now for down. lessons for me. I'll have to try since I'm not married, but uh, Mike, give us your websites. So people can look that up online. Yeah. Please visit socialjumpstart.com Or if you want to hear a little bit more about the actual business storytelling stuff, uh, program we uh, put together is at mikewalpert.com. Sounds good. Oh, Mike, it's been wonderful having you on the show. We got to have you on more. One of the things I'd love to have uh, you talk about uh, on another episode is uh, some of the insecurities people have about being on video. Like a lot of women have those issues because they, they, you know, they, they're mm -hmm. really concerned oh, about gosh. their look. And so I, I meet a lot. One, that's one thing I hear about people wanting to go on video is their insecurities about that. And uh, maybe we can talk some of the other things, like for me, the shit that you get from trolls and how to deal with that and survive oh, it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the insecurity stuff is funny. I yeah. did video training. Most of our business is online training. We, we provide video courses for businesses about marketing. And we've been doing that for years. And I was doing those sorts of videos for five years until I looked at one and said, yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> I think I'm still working Sometimes on you whatever go, you know my what? best video is going to be. <laughs> it's a journey. <laughs> it's a journey. <laughs> so everyone, guys, go check out Mike. I think you'll love him. Uh, I love his videos on Facebook. He puts up really entertaining stuff. Uh, I love how animated you are in your videos, and you move around and stuff, and you're not stoic, and, and you make them interesting. It's part of the story, the visual nature of it. Uh, where I see a lot of people that do these stoic videos and I lose interest in them very well because I'm just like, do you, do you move? Are you a mannequin? That's just kind of like you. I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I am occasionally over expressive. I had, oh, uh, I, I love it. I think it's incredibly uh, I, interesting. I love it. it. It is. It is what you get. Like, you know, I mean, I watch some of the videos and, and it's like, rrr, rrr. sometimes I used to wear contacts in videos and my uh -huh. wife is like, Oh yeah, wear the glasses. You look less bug eyed. I'm like, really awesome. That's nice. <laughs> uh, but I actually had somebody, we do a, a monthly meetup for digital marketing here in town. And I had somebody say, Ooh, Hey, do you practice your gestures and stuff before you do a video? And I was like, if I practice my gestures and I facial movements, would I look like, you know, like that's not what you practice. <laughs> but, it, but my point is, is that that's what it is, right? Like yeah. here's the package. If you don't like it, I'm sorry, but it's just the real thing. And if everyone's just the real thing, you get to be cool and, and you attract the people that are into you, not into the fake version of you, which then we you should talk about that. on another episode yeah, too. Being expressive is important because I do have people that I'll interview on this podcast and it's like trying to warm up a dead zombie and you're just like, dude, do you have any personality? <laughs> well, I'll look I look forward to it. Uh, maybe I got an excuse to come back. That's yeah, there you go. Anytime, Mike, anytime. Well, thanks to right my on. audience for tuning in. I hope you learned some good stuff. Check out Mike online, go to uh, youtube.com forward slash Chris boss, hit that bell notification button, subscribe to the channel. If you haven't subscribed, your life is probably less because of it. And you don't want that. No one wants that. So just subscribe. And, uh, I don't know, you, you might just see the, the light will come on in your life and, and you'll find I don't know, something. I don't know. I'm not sure it's what you want to find, but you'll find something. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Uh, go you'll to the um, So go to the ecvpn.com or Chris Voss podcast network.com. You can see the podcast there and you can subscribe at like a billion different places. Subscribe to iTunes, Spotify. Uh, what is there? Google music and stuff. Google play. Uh, you can get the podcast anywhere. It's that freaking popular.
Anyway, guys, thanks for tuning in. We certainly appreciate you guys, and we'll see you next time.